All right, welcome back. We are game 1005, that's game production one in the fall of 2022 semester at George Brown. There is week five, part one of our broadcast and recording. We are recording on YouTube right now because this is part of the stuff that you need for your midterm test, which is coming up in two short weeks. All right, just as a reminder and a little bit of administration uh, that next week on Monday we have Thanksgiving, so there will be no school for that day, so if you have forgotten, if you haven't planned anything or whatever, this is officially coming up the long weekend uh, in October, so um, hopefully you guys are going to have a good time. But that also puts a little bit of a, um, a, a twist, if you will, on the stuff that you guys got to do for Sunday, because we have some stuff to do on Sunday, right? And what is the thing that we have to do on Sunday as a bonus producers? And Designers, yeah. The design bonus thing. The design bonus thing, Brady says, right? Brady, very articulate of you. Thank you very much for that. It is the game design document bonus that you guys can get for your team. So if you haven't had a chance to start that off, or if you haven't met and talked about it, I think it's a good worthy to, to start that off and do as soon as possible. Let's do this Sunday at midnight. Again, we're sitting at uh, uh, week five, and we're talking about teams and specifically leadership, how to pick leaders, all that kind of stuff. And um, what we're going to be doing just in a minute or so is I want to talk about uh, a couple of things. One, project leadership, what that is, picking team leads. And I also have this new thing that I just talked to the producers about, which is your topic presentation one. It's a group presentation that you guys will be doing uh, for leadership and teamwork. It's posted on Blackboard. Please see the fine requirements for this, all right? Which is, again, the next week, which is also a bit of a twist, isn't it? Because next week on Tuesday we meet, and it's due just before class is up, that's 2 o'clock p.m. Next Tuesday, you will be presenting live. I want your best presenters, again, just like we talked about last time, you can choose the same people, you can have new people if you want. It's totally up to you. Um, and this topic is gonna be everything about leadership and teamwork. Let's talk about a little bit about that. Let's take a look and see what that looks like right now. Just going to go right in here. I know, eh? It's, it's, it's a comedy of errors. We will get into that eventually. It's always amazing when you don't have anybody to help you out when you do uh, live video. It's amazing. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I want to go into our topic presentation number one. And let's take a look at it. It's kind of up here on, uh, on Blackboard. Again, do week six. That's October the 11th. That's one week exactly from today. So forget what it is right now. It's due one week from today. How the heck are you guys going to figure out how to do it, put it together, put the PowerPoint on, practice it, and everything else, especially when you have, yeah, leadership is the answer, uh, especially when you have um, you know, uh, Thanksgiving weekend, uh, for the most part, family stuff for some of you happening. And this is stuff that's due on the day we get back. There's lots of ways to do this. The worst way to do this would be to cram and to get it done like in day. So you show up on Tuesday morning and then you work really, really hard to put the week together a popcorn presentation, slap stuff, slap some stuff together, your best presenter comes up and tries to present as best they can. That'd be the worst thing you can do, right? So we don't want that. We want something a little bit better than that. And what is the task? Task one, working with your team, create a five minute presentation on either what makes a good leader and or what makes an effective team. This is the first topic presentation, quote unquote. Your team should include the following slides, a team slide that identifies your topic. Oh, sorry, a title slide. Uh, ensuring, ensure you include your team name, hopefully you have that by now. A team slide that includes your current team. And again, you can use the same slide from your team introduction presentation if this is still accurate. Sometimes it's not. And sometimes, uh, some people have had in their team presentations from the first time, they had multiple slides. So that won't do for this one. Please don't do that and reintroduce everybody again. I don't need that, right? Uh, that took a lot of our time last time. Try and be more succinct and make it one slide that has everybody on there if possible, okay? If you can't fit it on because people's names are long or you have 10 people in your team, it's difficult to figure that out. You could use two slides, but literally you're just going to say, this is our team, and it just mention any changes, that kind of thing, okay, if you're going to do that. I expect by this point that everyone's images will be 
available for this one. So if you didn't have your image up last time, or you missed it, or you didn't want to do it, or whatever, it's required. If you don't have it again, you will lose marks for your team. So please make sure that everything is complete as I require. Three slides about leadership and or teamwork. Not one, not two, but three. I want three exact slides, okay? That's what I want. And it could be what makes a great leader, what makes a good team, you know, what, how they work together. There's lots of ways we can put this together. Um, I don't want this to be a business presentation, okay? I mentioned this before, and our fine friend Igor said, are you gonna do a business presentation again? Or do you want that, or it's not a business presentation? The answer is you guys are in game development, all right? We're, we're doing something more fun, my expectation is, and make it fun. Make it so it's branded with your game that you're currently making. You're going to continue developing your brand with this presentation. That's what it is. So please don't let it go and use a stock PowerPoint presentation, which is completely useless for our environment. Please don't do that. Okay? And when I say be creative, I mean it. Be creative. All right? I'm not going to say what that is. I mentioned a couple of, uh, kind of gave you guys a few hints last time about what being creative is. There's three slides, you can do a lot. Some people last time would ask, can I use other things other than PowerPoint to do my slide deck? You know, something like present or something like that, right? Yes, you can, but it has to export somehow to a PDF, all right? So if it's not PowerPoint or Google Slides, then it has to be something you can export. If you can't export it, the answer is you can't use it, okay? So I don't want a link to your presentation. I want the presentation document itself, all right? So please make sure you do that. That is your task number one. You need to practice it, develop the PowerPoint slide deck and everything else. Meet with your team, discuss what's important to your team. Please do not give me Wikipedia, what is a good leader? All right, if you're gonna include images, cite them, right? So where do they come from? I want it officially, officially. Again, if it's a little citation at the bottom or a reference slide at the back that does not count towards your final presentation slides, okay? Um, would be nice if you made your own images. Some of you are artists, right? You can put things together to make it more interesting, right? Make this presentation your own. Again, you're developing your brand, but also what I'm hoping to do is get you guys to do more work when it comes to your team. I want you to brainstorm. When you get together with your team and you talk about what good leadership is, really understand for you what it means. Not, like I said, something that you found online. You can certainly reference some things online and pick and choose the things that make sense. We talked last week about um, insects. We talked about uh, colors, you know, and personality types, and identifying what people need, and who you are, and who they are, and how you can communicate best with them. This will give you a chance to practice those skills, and to, you know, kind of work with the team that you have, and to develop the full brain for your team, which means using all the colors, all the, um, all the personality types, all the people in your team to be the most effective you can. All right, so think about those things. I'm looking forward to seeing some excellent presentations next week. I want you guys to stretch yourselves. I really do. Um, and I need that in terms of um, how are you gonna present the materials that you're gonna use and so on. Um, I'm not gonna tell you that I want crazy stuff, right? But I, like I said, I'm looking forward to seeing some creativity. Okay, and I'll leave it at that. I'm not gonna say more than that. If I, if I say more, then it's not great. I'm just telling you what to do, okay? Um, task two, you will record a video of your presentation and upload it to YouTube. Yeah, YouTube, not some random streaming service. It's gotta be YouTube, right? So if you don't have a channel for your team, you could create one. You could use an existing channel that you already have, especially if you're a YouTuber or some kind of streamer. We have a couple of those in the class, right? Just saying, just saying, all right? Well, you could. I mean, if you wanted to, you know, to get people attention, you may not want to, right? Because it may not meet with your uh, standards, yeah. uh, standard, right? Uh, but anyways, um, if you're going to do that, you could use an existing channel or a new one if you want to. But the idea is that you're going to list it on on YouTube. If you don't want to list it, you could make it unlisted if you just want to use the YouTube uh, channel as a container for your video, so someone's going to host. So you don't have to list it at all if you don't want to. Um, and the video should be no longer than five minutes in length and include a voiceover of your presentation and, your, and basically you're, you're just voicing over and doing the same things. I recommend you do this one first before you present on Tuesday at Classical. This will give your presenter a good chance to practice the timing, 
as well as what you're going to be saying uh, in your presentation. So that's coming up. That's test two. Test three, you will present your topic during week six live. So there's the presentation materials, there's your YouTube video, and then there's your live presentation next week. Right? Only one presenter is required, but more than one person may present. And I said note here that you may, I recommend that you choose the best presenters. Task four, you will be asked to complete a survey. This is something that's new. So next week, remember I talked about this last time when we were together. I said it was really easy on you guys. I kind of said, yeah, I went around and talked to everybody. But next week, you guys are going to you know, produce a survey or answer a survey about your teams, the individual teams that are in here, about each other, and say, well, how do I think the presenter you know, did? How do they think they, you know, how did the presentation go? Did I like it? Did I like it? What were the materials like? What were the, you know, how did the presenter present? You know? Was the topic, you know, did it make sense? It wasn't just about the presentation materials, but did the topic make sense? The things that they talked about. Do you agree? Right? And we're also going to have some QA next week as well. So it's not just going to be you present and then see you later. There will be some discussion. And that's my expectation for what's going to happen next week. So um, it's an important topic, believe it or not, because we all have ideas of what makes a good leader, but it's good to discuss it, to talk about it. Some of you may have not really, you know, kind of uh, voiced it at all or expressed what is a good leader to you, right? And some people in, in previous semesters have used examples of good leaders. As an example, someone put up, I don't know, Abraham Lincoln. and asked me why, he just did. He went up and said, I love this guy, right? So, okay. And there's, because sometimes you might have an idol or someone that you want to talk about that you think is a current or past uh, good leader. Maybe you want to think about someone who's the future good leader, someone who we don't even have yet, okay, whoever that is. But you could use that as one of your slides. Okay, I want to talk about this as well. When you submit, um, you need to, to submit either an MS Microsoft PowerPoint presentation uploaded to Blackboard or a link to Google Slides. Um, I would even prefer a PDF, which is even better than this, and of course a link to your video demonstration on YouTube, it says, or another streaming provider, but again, I'd, provide, I'd prefer YouTube if it's possible. Any questions around topic presentation one? That's due next Tuesday at 2 p.m. So I know this is, yes? I don't think we need to go that far. But if you just like say something like, you know, kind of like maybe you have a bibliography page, you know, a reference page at the back, that kind of includes just the lines. You don't have to be structured. You just have to say, image number one, this is the source. That's enough. Okay, I don't need you to do that far, MLA or anything else like that. Okay? Any other, any other questions around the, this stuff that I'm talking about right now? This topic presentation one, again, do next Tuesday at 2 p.m. So let's talk about what we, what we learned last week, or last time we did this presentation, right? This is the presentation. So what did we learn last time? What really worked last time? I want to talk about this before I move on. Something that really worked last time that you guys saw during your presentations. Let's recall what really worked. Yes? I love it. An enthusiastic presenter. Someone actually believed in the presentation. Yeah. What else? That what, what else really worked? Oh, yeah. So something that is rehearsed, that feels natural. You feel like you're, you're being pulled along, which is good. And, um, and these are good things. This is, you know, you want to be able to, this is a presentation. We are watching it. It's, it's a form of entertainment in some ways too, right? So think about this. You're taking, you know, the, or you're capturing the attention of all the people in the room. So make it interesting, all right? Or you should be anyway. Um, so again, things to avoid, monotone. They try not to be monotone, try to vary your, your, uh, uh, the way you're speaking about it. Uh, be rehearsed, know what you're talking about. That's important too, right? So what I don't want you to do is read the slides, like actually look back and go, and, well, I'm way out of here. Don't do that, right? And you may use some kind of cue card system or you could read from your phone if that helps. But the best thing would be if you memorized everything. The same, right? Um, so think about your, you know, the presentation, run through it, you know what you're going to do, and you know what you're going to say, 
right? You may want to include during your live presentation things that also work, so I want to control the slides. Or, even better, you may include a clicker of some kind, right? So that the slides click for themselves, right? And this way, the timing is going to be exactly what you want, as opposed to you going next, right? I'm just saying, these are things that you can do. Clickers aren't that expensive. You can buy them from Amazon for, you know, under $20, if I'm not wrong there, right? So, pretty good. Um, I'm just saying, these are things that you can do to improve. Anything else that you can think of that I didn't cover that really worked for you last time? Yes? That really worked. That really worked well. Nothing? Okay. Uh, you said something else. You're, you're gonna have to this kind of make sure to have like, the right computer that can. Call them. Make sure you have the right computer that you can actually plug into the you know to the uh, podium over here so that everything works. So if, if something worked for you last time, you use that same thing this time coming up, right? So that when we switch presenters, it's a natural kind of switch over, right? How about things to avoid? Things to avoid during next presentation. I, I want to just. I don't want to talk too much to all about this too much, but I want to talk about it so that you don't say, oh, Tom, you never reminded us about this last time. And, you know, we did another presentation, it's the exact same thing we did last time. We didn't really talk about it again. We're talking about it again, right? Because, you know, I wanted to mention this already. So, what do we want to avoid? What do we want to avoid? Come on, guys, it's very simple. I'm going to have to go around and like, point at people and say, what am I going to avoid? Yeah. Monotone slides. Okay, I kind of said that too. What else? Business style presentations. Business style presentations. Okay, I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Excessive animations. I agree with that. But sometimes animations can be cool depending on how you time them. Yes. What else? Too much on the slide. Too much on the slide. Three bullet points max is the, is the normal rule with some sub, uh, sub points, if you will. That's okay. So it's not the words so much as the slide is more of something that's going to keep you in. Um, uh, organized, right, and you're using it for timing more than something that you're going to read. Yes? As well as for the actual presenter, the looking at the audience. Okay. Engage the audience, look at the audience. Don't, uh, uh, if you're going to use multiple presenters, don't cross over each other. We don't want that to happen. What else? What else do you want to avoid? Things that you want to avoid, things that you can improve. Okay, I'm going to have to go down here and engage people way down here because I have a mic. So I'm going to go over here. So what do I want to improve for next time? Are you going to present next time? He's like, no, I'm not presenting. So what should I avoid? What really bored you last time? Something bored you? Hold on. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So something what? People do what? People, when they kept stuttering. She was bored by people. Don't stutter, guys. Right? Whatever you do. What if, if, you're, if you stutter, it's a bad thing. I joke. Yes, it means be prepared. That's what the, I think that's what she's saying. Be prepared. Make sure that you understand the topic that you're, uh, you know, you're discussing, you're presenting, right? A couple of my other friend over here, you always have things to say. Talk to me. She's like, oh, thanks. Right? Go. We can tell when people didn't prepare for it. How about this? Can you tell when a, when a uh, professor doesn't know the topic? Right? When you go to a class, programming class, you go to another class, and then when you're looking at the professor, and they're looking at stuff materials, trying to figure out what to do, or they're, they're debugging something that they can't fix. Doesn't that feel weird, right? Like looking at something new debugging, right? Sometimes things, you have, no, you have no choice. By the way, it happens to me all the time, right? Where I'm debugging something, and I'm like, wait, wait, what? It's not working the way it's supposed to because things change, okay? But I'm talking when someone really doesn't understand what they're doing, right? Guys, you can't fool people. Right? That's the bottom line. They can see you and they can know, if, for the most part, if they watch you for five minutes, they know if you're a phony or not. Nine times out of ten, right? They can figure it out. Because we're like human lie detectors for many ways, right? If you watch someone enough time. What else? I got, I got my friend over here that I haven't talked to so much. Tell me, my friend. Where's your, where's your name tag? Oh, the name tags are missing. Producer. Who's the producer here? COVID! All right, yes. Okay, that's a, that's a good enough excuse. Name tags, name tags, name tags. Come on, guys. So talk to me. You got it now? Okay. You got to be into it. You want to try and sell it. Otherwise, if you're not into it, why should I care? Right? How about over here in the back? Just tell me what you don't want to see next time, next week. Something that really bugged you last time. 
Nothing bugged up. Everything was perfect last week. All right. How about these guys over here? What do you got? My friend? What bugged you with the presentation? What do you not want to see this time around again? People being too quiet. Okay. I got something that bugged me about the presentation last time. We didn't have a chance for Q&A. Right? That was a bad thing, right? We just kind of presented everything and there was no Q&A. That kind of bugged me. We're going to do that next time. What else? Make it fun, okay, make it fun. I know I'm trying to, to go and talk to you guys. Uh, you guys got your name tags, very good, very good. I got one person. Hello, thank you for following instructions. Right, Sam, I know you, right? Come on, right? And I got my other friends here who've got their name tags, right? One day I'm gonna make you guys like switch teams. You know, like say random, just go into a different spot to get to know each other. How about my friends over here? What is you not like? about the last presentation? What you didn't like? No, I liked yours. No. Talk to me about what you didn't like about the last presentation. Too many animations again. Okay, that's coming up twice now. Too many animations, right? So keep the animations light, keep the animations flowing, and make sure that they make sense. Okay. So we talked about this a little bit. I don't think there's anything that you're going to see right next time that we haven't discussed at this point hopefully we're going to be impressed with the stuff that you're putting together and i know i'm going on about this thing and you're like oh wait tom this is a game dev program why do i care about presenting so well in the first place guys and everyone else here as well you are selling yourself when you're selling your game half the time right it doesn't matter how you do it you make a demo reel or whatever part of what you're doing is selling yourself and you need to be able to present. All right, so that is uh, all about next week's topic presentation one. Okay, let's talk about team building a little bit as we move on to the new topic. So, game dev. It says here that it's a young industry, right? And why would it say that? Young as in how old since the 80s? By the way, I was watching uh, Karate Kid yesterday from my little guy, right? 1984, that's right. First one, right? The original Karate Kid, right? And the reason why I watched it is because Cobra Guy is on Netflix, and I was like, I haven't seen Karate Kid, I haven't watched Ralph Macchio in like, you know, 30 years, right? And, you know, I saw enough of it, I did Karate Kid 1, 2, and 3, and I was like, I'm done, right? And I looked back, and one of the scenes I saw in Karate Kid was they went to the arcade, right? Way back in the 80s. And you saw the 80s hair, and you saw the 80s arcade games. So really, for the most part, around the 80s, I would say, is where we, the video game kind of you know, craze took off, as far as I remember, way back in the day, right? Yes, it was around a little bit earlier than that, but for the most part, it was around the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, okay? So you might think that's a long time for you, right? It's not a long time. This seems like yesterday for me, right? Believe it or not. I mean, yes, I forgot a bunch of stuff. It was the age when uh, karate was like the karate kid and martial arts was big, right? It was like everyone wanted to be a, you know, a kung fu star, right? It was a big thing. Kung fu theater was on Saturdays, every Saturday on TV. We didn't have Netflix, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have computers, we didn't have the internet, right? All we had was the arcade and malls staying out of it. That's all it was back then, right? And um, so yes, game dev relatively is a young industry relative to some other things like, for example, the movie industry. I always compare game, the game dev industry to the movie industry because it's another form of entertainment. The movie industry has, you know, had many years uh, more than game dev. It started uh, as early as uh, the late 1800s, right, where they were starting to produce some kind of moving pictures. That's where it started off. And then into the 1900s, um, where it was actually really cool and people used it as a regular form of entertainment that started to replace live theater. Okay, that's what was happening back then. And now we're at the same step for us. The game dev industry is replacing movies for the most part. Right? Most people don't go see a movie as often as they play games. Right? We play more games than we ever do any we ever go see a movie. However, we do have a lot of streaming services out there. God, I think we're inundated with streaming services these days. Paramount Plus. We have uh, you know, Netflix, Disney Plus, um, every kind of thing you can think of out there, Prime, of course, right, and other ones like that. So we're inundated with enough 
content. And nowadays, there's some really good shows out there, some great shows, and some very bad shows out there. Um, thousands of channels on TV, if you want to actually do that same thing with Rogers or Bell or whatever. And, um, and yet, we still play more video games on average as a society right now, especially your age group, for the most part, um, you know, compared to any kind of movie watching you do. And when we do watch movies and shows, and we do watch live entertainment, or entertainment in general, we watch YouTube. We watch YouTube a lot more than we watch Netflix and Prime and everything else, believe it or not. A lot of us spend many hours watching YouTube or TikTok or on Twitter or social media or whatever, maybe as many hours, if not more, than uh, any kind of TV watching or shows or whatever, which is interesting. So things have really evolved, right? And game dev, in many ways, is one thing that makes game dev unique, like we talked about earlier this semester, is the interactivity, the immersion, the ability for you to lose yourself in the game and experience flow, right? Those kind of things. And um, that's the kind of stuff that, uh, that movies don't exactly do all the time. Sometimes we get lost in the show. Right? Lately, for me, that's Angle on Disney Plus. Some people hate that show, by the way. Right? But that's one of the shows that I really like to see. Um, and there might be other shows like that for you as well. But the idea for us is, when I'm skipping it, um, the idea here is that the game industry is starting to take over. And uh, although it's a new industry, it has some familiar demands. Okay. And um, one of the things that it has is what we need more and more of nowadays is leadership. And it starts with the producer. Right? So. Um, the producer is a lot of times managing, like it says, your young talent, but it's more like junior talent that's coming in, into a, um, uh, a game dev studio. So, for example, if you had a producer and you were going to work for Ubisoft, they might be, in many ways, one of the people you're going to interface on a regular basis. You know, uh, besides your team lead, most likely what you're going to do in a larger studio is go to your team lead first. You're probably going to talk to the producer once in a while but it's mostly that you're going to be working with your team lead in general. But uh, producers, what they do is they work on connecting with people. They work on making sure that all the people are active and engaged and that are producing. They're actually doing something for the game that they're working on. Okay? If they find that a, that a person or people aren't working, they're not going to hire them back. And the first times you work for a larger studio, they're probably going to work on contract. Okay. That's how it's going to work most times. Right? You work for a contract, whether it's six months or a year, or you work until the game is done. And then they may decide to renew, or they may decide not to renew. Some of that is your skill and what you produce. And some of that is, do they like you? Straight up, do they like you? Do they think you're a good, you know, a good fit for everyone else that's working there? Um, one thing that a producer needs to have is good leadership skills. And next week we're going to talk about some of what makes that great. What is what are good leadership skills? And um, motivation. I want to talk about motivation, and I highlighted this word for a reason um, to talk about. Question for you guys is: Can you really ever motivate anybody? I'm kind of post posting it that way. I'm kind of saying it that way. Some people are saying no. Anyone thinks they can motivate someone else? What is motivation anyway? I want to take a crack at that one. What is motivation? And if I'm going to motivate someone, please don't look it up on Wikipedia, um, you know, or something like that. What motivation is? Um, use your brain. What motivates you? What is motivation? Yeah. The encouragement to accomplish your task. Okay. Fairly good. Yes. What happened to your hair, man? Take it. I left your hair. It was, it was like it was big. It was big. Okay, fair enough. Yes, fair enough. Jacob has a pair of champions, right? So, um, go. So, so I think it's just motivating you. Yeah. Basically, it has to be incredibly amazing. Okay. There has to be something amazing or captivating about it. Something amazing or captivating about it that, would make, it that, would, make it that would, would make you want to do it. It has to be convincing. Can we add genuine? Right? Something that's genuine, something that's real, right? So, something that motivates you, right? Something that touches you inside, right? Sorry to say it that way. But, uh, you know, something that makes, like, moves you, you know, and that kind of thing, right? 
And there's different things that motivate different people. So really, think about the leadership's challenge, leader's challenge. How do you motivate everybody on the team when everyone has different reasons for being motivated? That's really challenging, right? So I go back to that first question. Can you motivate someone? Someone said yes today. That was the answer. I was like, yeah, I can motivate people. But in order for us to motivate them, we need to know them. Then we need to know what they want. That's why we did the thing we did last week. We want to know what people want. And a lot of times, most of us, some of us don't care what people want. Right? We just care about achieving goals. We care about you know, kind of uh, going to work, rinse, repeat, keep doing it, get things done. But we don't care about what people want, right? What people want, what people love, passion, right? Passion and motivation in many ways are connected, right? When you have a, a passion project, you're way more motivated, we'll talk about it like that, than if you're working on something that you've been given to do, but maybe you're not so passionate about it. Like, for example, next week's presentation. Some people might be super pumped about getting it done. Some people are like, oh God, in other words. Right? It really depends on the person. So that's, that's part of it. Um, so again, some people, there's two camps. One camp says, you can't motivate anyone. Motivation comes from the side. Okay? That's one camp. I'm going to present this to you. And the other one is, yes, you can. That's a complete lie. You can motivate anybody as long as you can get inside their head and understand their heart, what they want, right? Those kind of things. And if you can do that, and if you're a leader and you're leading thousands or hundreds or however many you're doing, maybe that makes you a good leader. You can motivate people, right? Motivation also comes from being a good role model sometimes, right? If you tell people you want them to do something because it's good for the company, you better go do it yourself, right? Walk to walk, talk to talk, that kind of thing is part of being a good leader, right? Some people say that that is true. So, um, what it says here is when the producer must take res this responsibility seriously to motivate people, people will stop collaborating with each other and all that kind of stuff if um, leading people and motivating them isn't something serious that the, the producer takes, you know, keeps in mind. So one thing is that uh, when we talk about team building and the, the producer is responsible for team building, have any one of you or any of you, and I know some of the older people here in the class maybe have done it, but what about some of the younger guys? Have you done team building exercises before in, in some kind of you know, work settings? You're looking like you don't know what I'm talking about? Team building exercises. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, what do we do with team building exercises? Why do we even bother doing them? Why do, I, why do you go to a retreat sometimes? By the way, I've gone to retreats and I've gone to some crazy team building exercises. Yeah. Which drive you crazy with this sometimes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I like it. So you work, you get stressed together, right? And then you try and figure out how things go. That's very good. I call it uh, being in the trenches together. It's kind of like a war analogy, but I'm not, I'm not sure it's the right one uh, in this day and age. But, um, you know, in D&D or in other kind of games when we play, right, for me it's fighting back to back, right? When you're surrounded by enemies on all sides, you fight back to back, and you manage to get through something, right, with that other person, whatever it is, right, whether it's a partner, a uh, boyfriend, a girlfriend, a wife, a uh, friend, a brother, a sister, a family member, and you get through it. You get through some tough times together, whether it's a health issue, whether it's something else, sometimes we form bonds with those people, mm -hmm. right? And that's what team building exercises are for. They're for you to form bonds, bond with other people, right? Um, and when you bond with somebody else, there's more understanding sometimes, right? We deal with conflicts all the time, but if you're if you're bound, if that you're, if that is your, if you consider that person part of your kind of external or you know, you know an extended family member, you may have a little bit more compassion for that person's situation. You may want to help them. You may they may want to help you. Right? And that creates an environment where you're going to produce more potential. Right? That is the reason why we do team building exercises. So that when you trust each other, because half the time, what does it we want to do? We want to build trust. But banks are great at this kind of thing. Let's talk about the banks for a second before we go further. The banks want to sell you mortgages, they want to sell you financing, they want to sell you all this stuff. 
And the banks, what do they want to do with you, young people? They want to bring you in, and they want you to deal with one bank exclusively, right? They want you to deal with that bank compared to any other bank. Not for now, but forever. For you, for your family, and for your extended family. And the way they want that to be done, of course, because they want to sell you their services, is to build trust. That's what they want to do. And they do that more so with people who are in the ultra high net worth category, the people who are in the, you know, the top Canadians in terms of wealth management uh, in the country. They do that a lot. And why? Because those Canadians know other people. And we call those people centers of influence. Right? When, we, when we deal with uh, people like this, right? centers of influence. One person knows another person, knows another person, and then they start trusting you because they trust you, then these other people trust you. We usually call these people referrals, right? You refer, if I want a plumber, maybe some of you know a plumber, right? As an example, and I say, hey, do you know, do you know a plumber that works well with you? Right, you trust them, and so because you trust them, we create this third party trust relationship. You trust them, I trust you, that means I must trust them, right? That's how it works. So this idea of trust is what we want to do with building, you know, building a team. Team building exercises, that's what we want to do more than anything else. We want to build trust. Because without trust, we can't build friendships. We can't build good relationship of work. We can't work with somebody, right? Because if I don't trust somebody, I want you to think about this. Imagine working in a situation where you don't trust your manager or your leader, the person that's, that's in the position that's taking care of you. You don't trust them at all. Anyone in that situation right now, you don't trust them. You have a boss that you're working for right now, and you don't trust them. You don't know what they're going to do, what kind of work they're going to give you, um, if they're going to fire you tomorrow, um, you know, if they're treating you equally like everybody else. Is there someone like that that you work with or you have worked with in the past? Okay? You don't trust them. Tell me, give me an example. They don't have to Gossiping about other people. Here's the thing about gossiping about other people. If if a leader or even another employee gossips to you about somebody else, they're gonna go gossip about you to somebody else. Right? That's the major rule. Right? The rule is if you see if you talk to a gossiper, right, and they're gossiping about people talking negative, they're gonna talk negative about you somebody. It's gonna happen. Hundred percent. Alright? And um, so that is an issue, you know, if you can't trust someone. Sometimes they'll, they'll try and bring you into their trust and tell you stuff that you shouldn't know. That stuff is inappropriate. When you see a leader doing inappropriate things, acting in an inappropriate way, it's not a one-off. To me, when I see inappropriate behavior in a leader, whatever that is, it's like seeing mice at your house. If there's one mouse that you see, there's many more mice somewhere in the walls or somewhere else. It's not just one mouse that you're going to see. You're going to see lots of them. Or like seeing cockroaches. There's another really good one. See one cockroach, there's got to be more than one, right? Which means chances are, if you see inappropriate behavior, there's other stuff going on behind the scenes, right? And once we see that stuff, because we can smell when something's wrong, we can smell a fraud a lot of times, we can smell someone who's not right, we will not trust that person, it'll break our, our belief, we may start looking for other places to work. It starts like that, very simply like that, okay? So we want to build trust. Here's something else when it comes to team building exercises. We want to be genuine, okay? So stuff that you don't want a leader to tell you is things like, like I, I kind of talked about this before, you're the best. You know, buddy, you're the best. You're the best, buddy. You know what, you're the best. Hey, you know what? Yeah, I know you're looking at your phone, but you're the best, right? And you know what, you're the best. No, you know what, you're the best. I really, guys, do I really care? Do I really think they're the best? Hell no. That's what they ask. If I say, no, I'm not saying no, I'm not saying no. But can, you imagine, can you imagine if everyone, if the leaders always, you hear this leader talking, and he always says, you're the best, right? It's not genuine, right? It's a sham. It's the way he's glad handing everybody. Oh, hey, you know? It's not, nothing wrong with being happy. There's nothing wrong with being happy. It's just that you don't want, um, you want someone to be genuine, you want someone to be transparent. You want them to speak the unvarnished truth to you, okay, a lot of times. It's tough for a leader to do so because if they speak the unvarnished truth, well, that's hard, right? So, um, so think about those things. Want to build trust. No trust, no relationship. 
So again, we view them as a team leader. I talked about this a little bit. Um, okay, let's talk about this. Do you believe uh, leadership is natural or do you think it can be made? Are leaders born or are they made? What do you think? Yeah. Can be, it can be both, okay? What else? What other opinions? I agree with that it can be both. You can be born, but not the best, and then work on it. Okay, you be born a leader, and not the best, and then work on it. What else? Anyone else? Anyone else have a, an alternate opinion, right? Can leadership be taught? Yes. You think it can be taught? Okay. What else? Different colors, okay. Okay. So some people are natural, you know, people want to take control, but you can learn how to do it, right? What else? You can do it. Okay. Do you believe that tall people are better leaders? Right. Do you think tall people are better leaders? The next one will say yes. <laughs> yes. I uh, really trust you, man. All right. Uh, yeah. So you are the best. Okay. Let's go to this. So tall people. Why am I saying this? Tall people are better leaders. Okay. Uh, well, I have a hand up here. Because if you receive positive reinforcements because of your Right. Might increase your confidence because you're already tall and you're different maybe than other people. Yes. They have better tools to become Why? Better tools to become Why? Wait, wait, why? Why does a tall person have better tools to become a leader? Yes, Sam. They're used to attracting attention because they're tall. Yes, David. Might be too much for you, but it might be that more people. Considered maybe because you know, early life, everyone does a little bit, but also tall. Okay. All right, could be. So it's a Freudian thing, but because people are taller than you, you're young, you're little, and you grow up and you believe in tall people, yeah. Okay. I think it has nothing to do with it, but I think it's not Looks up to you. Can I have a hand over there? Yeah. Subconscious? Here's something. Take a look. Do a Google search, right? And think about, look at tall leaders and how many tall leaders there are compared to shorter leaders. You'll see that there, are, for quite often, leaders are actually taller than average, right? Which is really weird psychologically. Right? James. Okay. So um, it's a really weird thing. So really, it's a true thing. It's not um, you know we can make fun of it as whatever it is. It's almost like our perception of things. And because our perception is reality, in many cases, right, we kind of perceive people who are a little bit taller, right, as maybe, you know, someone we want to look up to, we want to, you know, um, we want to listen to. How about this? People with an accent are better leaders. <laughs> you know, I'm not making this up, right, this stuff. People with an accent, especially a British accent, are better leaders, right? What do you think? Do you think that's true? Yeah. yeah. But I'm just asking, here in the West. Here in the West, yes. Why do they use British accents to sell stuff here in the West? Yeah. They sound smarter. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? They sound smarter, right? Maybe they're not, but their vocabulary you're saying is something that makes sense. Yeah, take it. So, wait, so if I was going to construct a leader, fake, right, and I got a really tall person with a British accent, right, male or female, doesn't really matter, right, for now, yet, okay, then they would be a better leader than what a leader would, right, because none of you really have, anyone have a British accent? Yeah. How about people that are really tall? Like, really tall, I'm talking about, like, you know, six foot three, six foot five, that's around the, the right, uh, around, around the right height, the couple people that are pretty tall in the room. So a tall person with a British accent. Okay, how about this? 
Are there more women leaders or are there more men leaders? Does that really care? Like, is it gender a thing when it comes to leadership? This is a weird thing, too. Real weird, weird step. Okay? And by the way, I believe it should change. Right? The reality is there's many, many more male leaders for whatever reason than there are female leaders in the world. Alright? But it doesn't mean that that is correct. It doesn't mean that it is right in any way. And we shouldn't even think about gender at all when it comes to uh, to this situation. But unfortunately, you'll see many in many cases that that is true. Sometimes, uh, depending on the organization, you know, it's almost like it's a thing with the organization, right? For many years, especially for the last 50 years, I would say, we've been fighting against male-centric leadership, okay? And of course, what we want in an organization is a mix that has nothing to do with gender, but has some, everything to do with perspective, which is what we want to focus on. It's not a gender thing, it's a perspective thing. But tall leaders seem to be more popular, to be honest. And leaders with a British accent in the West, for some reason, is a thing, right? We gotta get over it, okay? We gotta get over this. And I want you guys, as the young people that are coming into the game dev industry, to start tackling this for yourself. Don't just look at a person for their stature, you know? There was an old uh, saying, small stature, but large indeed. Right? And that's the thing that we want to go to, right? Um, we want to move from that. If someone is a, is a small person or a quiet person, it doesn't mean that they can't be a good leader, right? They might have great ideas and they might be able to motivate you because they might be able to say the exact right thing that you need, right? At the time that you need it in order for you to be successful. We should give everyone a chance. Okay, boss. Versus leader. This is an old image. You can find this on the internet ten times, right? So look, very, very. They don't think we'll look hard. I think to find this one, right? Boss versus versus leader, right? And some of these are weird. This is a, a cliche. If many ways, in many ways, I kind of look at this as a cliche, right? Um, I've had bosses, and I've had leaders, right? And for me, beyond what this image tells me, I don't have to look at the image to understand the difference, right? It all comes down against the thing we just talked about, which is trust for me. A boss doesn't trust anybody, right? He doesn't even trust himself or themselves, right? A boss is all around ego many times. And there are a lot of times when we, when we think about a boss, they have a task you know, to, to do, and they want to pull you along and get it done, right? Whereas a leader is someone else. A leader is there with you. Right? A leader doesn't let, I'm going to say this, I'm sorry, and I apologize in advance, I'm going to say this on YouTube. A leader doesn't let shit roll downhill, all right? They catch everything first themselves. They make sure that their team is preserved, they can look after themselves, right? But they also look after you, which is the most important thing, right? And it's rare. It's rare to find someone to say, like, no, that's someone I want to be with. I want to work for that person. You might have seen someone like that. Okay. Does anyone have an example of a person that they work with or that they saw in, the, in an organization that they worked in? Maybe it was a school or maybe it was something else that you did that you, you said, wow, I wish that I could work for that person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Uh, this is a story. Yeah? We, have to, we have to hear the story. All right? I like hearing stories because this is, this is stuff that's real. This is like the real stuff. So you're going to talk about it here. All right. We had a, uh, uh, I worked in a kitchen and uh, we didn't have a dishwasher one day and we were super busy. It was like right before Christmas time. And, uh, you know, dishwasher is like the bottom of the totem pole in a restaurant business. And uh, my chef just, Rolled up his sleeves and washed every single dish in that place. We even asked him if, if you know, we should help him. He said, "No, I got it. Keep doing what you're doing." Because we we all felt like he should be doing that because he is the leader, but he was doing it himself. Great example. Which means that once someone is willing to pick up the slack, they're going to walk the walk. They're going to talk the talk. They're the person that's you know they're not just laying down the rules, but they're demonstrating. They're leading by example. This is an example of leading by example or being a role model, right? That they didn't have to wait for someone to say, hey, can you do that? Right? They did it. It could have been someone else, like the manager of the restaurant or something. I had to go to and say, look, I need someone to wash the dishes here. But the head chef didn't have to do that. He just kind of just went ahead and did it, right? 
And that picking up responsibility without a thought, that's a good thing, right? Anyone else have an example of someone that you wanted to work with, right, that they maybe met in your life or, you know, or maybe someone that they've seen on, on uh, you know, in media or something like that they want to work with, someone that inspires you today, right? Anybody? Yes? Um, Books, 
on the internet is going to be impossible, especially the first edition books, which uh, need a lot of trust, you know, for the for the people that are online. Um, and what he did was he swallowed all those people. He kind of bought all the people that had online businesses back then, uh, networks that you can call up and buy first edition books. He swallowed them all up and made Amazon from it. He almost did that with a friend too, um, and bought up all their books, all the books that uh, that they have, all these first editions. And it was kind of interesting. So he was someone that later on we're like, wow, this guy is actually a visionary, right? He's really, really cool, right? And then afterwards we're like, yeah, no, he's not a visionary, right? He's actually just another businessman. And you know, so we, we kind of went through these stages where we kind of liked him, we didn't like him. That's just how it is. The same thing with, with Elon Musk. I kind of liked him at one point, and now I don't like him too much, right? Especially after the whole Twitter thing and all the other stuff that we've seen in the news. Yes, it's innovative, but there's a cost. You know, sometimes, uh, especially influential people, have an influence on our lives, right? And um, without a care, he can, he can influence a lot of people. One of the things that I've always heard is this. Uh, if, you know, uh, I, I was speaking to a lot of, uh, kind of younger people in a school, and one of the people put up their hands and said, you know, um, so we're talking about if you had a billion dollars, you know, or $44 billion to buy Twitter, would you do something different? And one of the kids raised their hands and said, how about 44 billion trees, right? Both of you put up your hand and said that. And I was like, oh, that's inspiring. Um, and I mean, it came from a, you know, uh, from a child. And, um, but yet, Elon Musk can see that. So, um, so again, one thing is confidence. Here's something that, uh, some, we're gonna talk about traits and new leadership. And you can take some of these for your, uh, for your slide presentation for next week. Um, confidence. Right is a big thing with leadership. If a leader is not confident and they're not able to stick with their decisions, right? That's a problem. Okay. Actually, uh, we had our friend from across the pond there, our friend Boris, right? Boris Johnson. He actually had a uh, there was a lack of confidence around him, and that's why he was actually basically booted out of being the Prime Minister of the UK, right? And so it, it happened with, everyone lost confidence in him. And part of the thing was that people didn't believe that he had confidence in his own plan, which is part of where it came from. So confidence is a big one. Vision, mission, values, right? Um, a lot of times leaders come across with this, and when there's a new VP or a new leader, a lot of times in an organization, um, they usually come across with some kind of strategic plan. Okay. You might see this a lot. And at Bell, when I was working for Bell for years as a, uh, a director, I can tell you that I had many, many VPs come in and they moved us from building A to building B, from building C to building D. We structured this organization, split this one in half, made a new one over here, had a new plan to do that. And it was just like turmoil at Bell for the, you know, the entire time that I was there. Every single year, I must have had two or three VPs that I was reporting to at different times. Okay? because that was what Bell was about at the time, right? And leaders, especially at that level of VP, have to justify their existence in some ways, right? So they have this big strategic plan to come up with a vision, right? So vision is definitely something that a leader should have, okay? Um, passion, positive attitude, courage is the word that I've highlighted here on the slide, right? And here's something else that I want to talk about. Sometimes a leader has to make some unpopular decisions, but they have to present those decisions to you in a way that you can understand because maybe it's a financial thing that they have to talk about. Maybe it's because things aren't working out and maybe they need to make some changes in the organization. But the organization, right, which is you know something that the leader is about, is bigger than them, right? They have to kind of, they're doing it for the organization. Um, but they're also doing it for you. How do I pass down information to you? Some difficult decisions that have to be made and have difficult conversations without losing your confidence, without breaking your trust. That's really challenging, right? So they have to be able to do something like that. They have to translate the difficult into the simple, which is kind of something interesting as well. So there's a bunch of leadership traits that I've got here. Not leadership traits, I'm going to talk about them. So honest. Here's one that I talked about already. Uh, speaks the unvarnished truth and keeps promises. Again, you may include or not include some of these things. If you're going to include any of these traits, I need you to talk to them. I want you to tell me why they're important to your team. 
right? A good communicator, right? They're clear and concise. Confident and consistent, walks the talk, right? Uh, committed and passionate, they have got an all-in attitude. They're all in, they're committed, right? They're not just gonna tell you to be committed and not do anything, it's they're, they're in it as well. Um, Self-management, they have self-control. They're not gonna go, you know, uh, sing Bohemian Rhapsody, right, during the Queen's, you know, time where they're gonna, you know, lay her to rest. I'm sorry, but Justin Trudeau, I, you know, I'm not gonna make, I'm not a political person here, I'm not trying to make a political statement, but maybe that wasn't such a smart thing to do. That's all I'm saying, all right? I don't mind the leaders having a good time, but that was weird, right, for me, in my opinion, right? And I'm saying, I'm, I'm expressing the opinion of Tom now, not George Brown. Okay, so let me know that. Just in case some people say that, you know, it's George Brown doesn't like trust Justin Trudeau or something, he's not sure yet. Yes, he went out, he was during the, you know, when the Queen's, um, you know, there's these 10 days of mourning, and Justin Trudeau went out and sang Bohemian Rhapsody as a tribute to the Queen, right in the bar. And uh, that to me was weird. I mean, I'm not trying to take this out of context. Again, it's a news story. I wasn't there personally, so I have to be honest and say that. But it's kind of weird, and that comes down to self-control. We've seen a lot of leaders uh, in the news over the last 10 years that have exhibited a lack of self-control, Trump, right? And other leaders like that, right? And to me, that's an issue, right? And when I mean self-control and self-management, because again, it comes down to the leader being a role model for the institution, for the you know the company, for the country, right? And self-control is one of those things. Uh, they foster creativity and innovation, that's another one. Um, inspires through their vision, short term and long term, sets clear goals, they might have key performance indicators that they, that they pass down the ranks through the entire you know kind of a senior management chain, right? Um, they uh, have strategic thinking, right? They lead to win for their company and for their people, okay? That's what it comes down to. It's not just about the company, but it's also for the people. That's an important one for me, right? And um, they make quick quality decisions, quick quality decisions. The reason why I think this is important is, imagine if a leader can't make decisions. <laughs> that's, that's a problem for me. Or if they have to lead by you know, the majority, lead by democracy, Guys, sometimes there's no, there's no time for leading by democracy. A leader's got to make some decisions sometimes. And it's got to have vision, be confident, or they have to have vision and be confident and do what they need to do, okay? Um, they're accountable and responsible. They own the problem. They don't kind of pass the problem down to, a, to a, someone that's below them uh, or lateral. They're people-oriented, right? They have some empathy. And they delegate and empower, they engage their people, and maybe they promote teamwork or team building. These are all possible leader traits that you might choose. And there's many other ones, but I would say these are the top ones that I've found over the years that I'm sharing with you, okay? So, lots of stuff here to, to, you know, to absorb, and you may have seen some of this, you may have seen none of this. Hopefully in your life you're gonna see someone that that was all these things, right? That'd be awesome. It's rare. And it's rare nowadays more than ever because here's something that, that you may have heard. Everybody has a price and everybody is corruptible and absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? But let's just step outside that for just one second and believe, just believe that there's a possibility that there might be a leader that steps forward, a real leader, right? We haven't seen that in a lot and different things. A real leader that uh, you know that walks the walk, that talks the talk, that is someone who is um, you know gonna kind of aspire to to do all these things in the moment. It would be awesome if we had someone like that. So one thing is that we talked about nurture and nature. Is it uh, is a leader born or is a leader made? And I come back to that whole thing when it comes to uh, know thyself insights from last week, right? And we mentioned it today too, right? Sure, there are some people who are natural at being aggressive. There are people who are natural at asserting themselves. There are people who are natural at being goal oriented, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean it make them a great leader, right? And one thing that we have to think about is there's two parts that can do it. It's not just about um, you know, your personality, but also your temperament. Okay, temperament is huge, 
right? It's the ability for you to be able to, you know, um, take a breath, you know, and realize, you know, that it's it's not just a, it's not about you. It's not all about you at all, at all, in, in any way, right? It's not about you. And um, when you take it to that level, when you say it's not about you, then you're not the smartest person in the room. You know that whole thing about the smartest person in the room. If you're in the smartest person in the room, then you shouldn't be in that room, in the wrong room, right? I agree with that. You shouldn't be the smartest person in the room. The people that are around you, right, are the people that you're working with, and that you're. You might be driving a vision. You might want to try and inspire and support those people. Um, you know, but just again, being the smartest person, or it's all about you. We don't want that kind of leader all the time. You know, sometimes it is. It's, it's okay to have someone like that when we need someone temporarily to, to achieve a goal. And sometimes a leader might appear that we need that's maybe, you know, wouldn't work in other times. Okay, I gotta talk about that as well. Because we're being very general. All these traits that I put down here are traits that I found. You might find traits that are contra, that speak in kind of in, in um, contrary to what I've, what I've said. So you, may, you might find some traits that are like, you know, it doesn't mean it, it's something that, that speaks to you, but it goes against what I've talked about it here. And because it's because <clears throat> a specific type of leader might be needed at the time. Let's talk about picking team leads for a second, okay? And I want to uh, just look at the time here. We're, we're about 3.08, and I'm going to take a short break very soon. Um, but I, I want to continue talking about leadership before I get into. Um, uh, this as well. Any questions or thoughts about the stuff I've talked about? I've talked about leadership, I've talked about courage, I've talked about all these really nice lofty traits. Um, but here's something I also want to say, which is a leader is still a person. Right? They have a chance to make mistakes. You know, they, we should give them the opportunity to, to make mistakes. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes, you know, when we, we see somebody make a mistake, we're like, wow, and I thought that they were the person that was inspiring for me. We might look at someone like this as an actor or a celebrity, but we might have been really disappointed lately because we, we heard that they, you know, made a misstep or they did something wrong or whatever that we don't agree with, right? But I always think about this, you know, it's a really, it's a real challenging thing, right, to become a leader, especially if you're in politics, okay, and I'll just put it like this too. Let's suppose that you decide today to get up and become a politician, okay? What can happen when you're a politician? What do they do to vet you when you're a politician? Does anyone know? I really want you to think about this for a second. You, today, you're, tomorrow, you're gonna to be a politician. And, you know, they're gonna vet you. What are they gonna do during the vetting process? Yeah. Trying to show you're weak. Trying to show that you're weak? Okay, what else are they gonna do? Yeah. They're gonna go through your entire recorded and unrecorded history. I like that, that was great, okay. Can anyone claim, and put up your hand if there's someone who's never had a problem, made a misstep, something that's embarrassing, something that you said or did that was wrong, that today you wouldn't be crucified for? Put your hand up. But yeah, you never done anything that's wrong? Oh, I have. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. Come over here, man, talk to me. I want to know who you are. Ah, that's it. Now you're more the best, right? All right. Yeah, I'll tell you right now, I don't want anybody like that. I definitely wouldn't want, wouldn't want to go into that, like to be a, a politician. It's, it's pretty crazy what they do. I know people uh, in politics um, and what they've gone through. And um, they're brave people. They're brave people. Some of them don't care what people find out about them. Um, but I don't know anybody who's got a spotless image or that hasn't done something that for them, right? Or that hasn't, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, had an issue in the past at some point. Okay, if you look at any one of our politicians, if you dig deep enough, right, you might find something that is not sparkly about them, right? And that's okay because they're people. They're people, just like we are. They're not robots, right? They're not androids. They don't exist in another reality. They're they're us, right? And it's a different form. And that's another thing to think about. Although they are idols and everything else. Their job, what they've taken on, is to, is to lead, right? So that is a very challenging thing to do. Okay. Any questions or thoughts around leadership? We just talked about leadership. I'm just going to go shift into picking team leads and how that's done. So one part when we pick a team lead is about expertise. This is a good thing and a bad thing. We see an artist who's awesome, 
right? They're awesome at doing what they're doing. And we're like, wow, we would love this artist to be the team lead, to be a role model for the entire team. So we're gonna make them into a leader. Is that the right thing to do? I've got the best artist in my team, and I'm gonna make them up into a leader, a team lead. Yeah, Jacob. Jacob says no, why not? Agent skills and technical skills, you know, uh, don't necessarily come coincide, right? Just because they're an amazing artist doesn't mean they can lead a team, right? Number one. Number two, do I really want to have my best artist if I was the producer stop being the best artist? That's a problem too. And some people might say, wait, wait, wait. So you're saying that if I'm really good at what I'm doing, it's going to hold me back from having, you know, higher positions. And the answer is, yeah, well. Yeah, for a time it will. Absolutely. Because if the producer's smart enough, you'll see that you're awesome. He might compensate you in some other ways, give you opportunities to show off your work, do coaching and all that kind of stuff, and maybe over time mentor you or send you to, you know, to some kind of training programs to help you with leadership skills, right? But um, they're gonna try and hold on for you to you as, as long as they can within reason. And if, if it's a good producer, they're gonna not hold you back, but rather they wanna build you up. They're gonna build you up, and that's what they're gonna do. At the same time as making sure you still deliver that awesome work that you can do. Yeah. So the producer is the leader. Producer is the leader, right? But what I'm saying, when it comes to making a team lead, like for example, let's say, um, if it is someone who is, let's say, the software engineering team lead, right? So there's the software engineering person, and what if I made you, the, you know, the software engineering manager, right? So you're not no longer actually doing your code, you're just managing your team. But you're the best software engineer that we have, right? Positive, you're gonna have staff that you can develop and coach and make better, right? That's the good thing that, that's there. Negative, I'm gonna lose the best coder that I have, potentially, right? And the risk is, here's another thing, when I bring up a, a person from within the team that they're working in right now, um, that's also a challenge. I see you coming in, I see you, I see you. Okay. I've seen all these people that have come in lately, that are late, right? A good hour, almost, for some of you, or 45 minutes, right? And I don't want that, especially next week when we're doing our presentations. Guys, please don't do that for next week. Remember, during our presentation time, we want to give the person who's presenting as much attention as possible and be respectful. So please be on time uh, next week or early. All right, so that, that is an issue, you know, when it comes down to, uh, um, you know, kind of promote, promoting from within is the problem, right? Because we're going to promote someone who want to do this. Um, and the thing is, what if they step forward? What if, the, you know, this, this person who's awesome at a software engineering job, or they're awesome as a gameplay, uh, you know, kind of programmer, or they're awesome as an AI programmer, or whatever they're going to do, they step forward and say, I want to be the team lead. Should you really say no? As a, as a leader, as a producer, or as a uh, higher up, should you? The answer is no, you shouldn't say no, because guess what, those people that put their hands up and step forward are few, they're not that many, number one. And um, so you wanna promote them, you wanna encourage them, but sometimes you can't put them up right away, especially if they're the best of the best, it's challenging. So on one hand, yes, you, you're you awesome, and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get compensated, you're gonna probably have longevity at the company, on the downside, it may be held back. Does anyone have examples of that in real life? Where you've seen someone who's awesome and you just, you just don't understand why they haven't been promoted? Yeah. Uh, I actually worked with a guy who's with a production company. Yeah. And one uh, of the guys was part of the company production operator. Yeah. They have a program that was essentially. What do you think of that? How did that make you feel? I don't know. It is terrible. And that action, although uh, it's for the, bet the bet betterment of the company, if you will, it's not for the betterment of the people. Remember that we have to strike this balance. Um, I was talking about karate kid earlier. It's kind of interesting. 
And in Karate Kid, he said, uh, Pat Morita, who plays Mr. Miyagi, says, you know, it's all about balance, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to Daniel, the, the Karate Kid, he says. It's all about balance. It's not just about balance in martial arts, but it's about balance in life, right? That's what he kind of said. It's kind of his thing that he said. And it's also about balance in the company as well, that we're working with. Balance. We have to balance between productivity and promotion. But we have to have, kind of have that balance because if all we think about is productivity, but we don't promote our people, we don't enable our people to be better, right? We don't empower them to take, to take control, right? We don't delegate to them you know, so that we can develop their skills, right? Because we don't believe that we can do that. We can't afford it, right? We need production, production, production. It's all about production. Um, that will make people you know, lose confidence. Unless we lose confidence in the company, we might want to leave, right? Yeah, you can't. I mean, imagine if you're if you're told this is the way you're supposed to do things, you do everything right, and you're being sandbagged, right? Which is what this looks like. Um, or you know, maybe a little bit of gaslighting there too. So um, let's continue. So again, we want to make strong leads, but we have to balance between you know a person's leadership skills and their their you know kind of the importance for them that they're going to have for the team which is kind of an important thing that we want to do. We want to be able to balance those things. And it's a real challenge to be able to do that. And like we said here earlier, even if they're the best at what they do, they may not be prepared for leadership, which means we have to have an internal uh, training program. Does that move this way? We have to have an internal training program. <laughs> Never have anything like that, uh, that works properly. That allows us to train leadership leaders. We want to be able to do that because um, it's one thing to have to, to say, oh yeah, we're going to promote you if you're going to be a leader. Uh, but especially in small companies, imagine an indie studio, you have 10 people, or 50, 50 people, let's say, something that's a small studio, right? And you want to you want to say, oh yeah, we're going to promote you, right? My, always, my, my concern always in a small indie studio or a startup is, show me your, you know, your guidelines, your, show me your employee handbook. You know, that kind of stuff. And for the most part, they don't have one, a lot of them, right? They're making it up as they go along. They're trying to survive. They're creating a product. They have an idea that they want to get with. Uh, or they've developed one really good product, and they're just building up the studio right now. And they're kind of writing the rules as they go. And that's a real challenge, right? Big organizations have this employee handbook. They have training programs. And that's why I, go, I tell you again, some of you may say, I never want to work for Ubisoft, I never want to work for Rockstar, I never want to work for Bethesda or EA, or any one of those big companies. I want to have my own, I want to start my own. And I'm telling you guys, that's not the right approach from experience. It's better to work for a large organization and understand all the stuff that they've, that they've put together, see what their, what, what their playbook is, and take the best things from their playbook to include in your organization when you do it, if that's what you intend to do, as opposed to starting from scratch. There's a lot of mistakes that they've gone through. They've done a lot of quote unquote play testing for their company, and you want to take those that playbook and run with it. Okay. So a leadership program is something that is required if you're going to promote from within. So we talked about this. Don't pick the most talented, right? Uh, necessarily pick the person who is, um, you know, is more of a leader. Sometimes two people will stand forward. You know, kind of stand up and step forward, and they'll say something like, if two people, one of them is like the best you know, programmer you have, and the second one is maybe not a great programmer, but a really great talker, and people love them, or love them, right? Maybe that's the person you want to come up, maybe, right? It's a real challenge again. You don't want to demoralize the person who's awesome at the job, right? But you don't also want to lose some of the talent that you need uh, for productivity. You have to create a balance. Um, I'm just going to skip through this a little bit. Let's talk about team building a little bit too. So we talked about team building and what that is. We want to build trust. Um, and building a strong, strong team is, is important because when we build a strong team, um, you know, we can work more effectively together. And this big one is getting to know each other. Just like you guys have done right now. There's been a team building exercise going on here for you guys from the very beginning since you stepped into this room, right? You were smashed together, whether you chose to be with the people that you saw or not. And slowly, slowly, you're starting to get to know the people in your team, right? And the team building exercise, some of you have rearranged desks, 
I see most of you now have, but some people that haven't, right? Um, but a lot of you have rearranged desks who face each other, almost like a round table, right? And um, you've done things in the room, and it's okay to do all those things. It's okay to rearrange stuff and make it customized for yourselves. It's all part of this team building exercise. Every single time I get you guys to do a, um, any one of these things, a topic presentation that you're going to be doing next week, there's an underlying motive. And the underlying motive is that I want you guys to be stronger as a team, right? Why? Because when it comes to actually doing the coding, that's the hard part, right? Doing the actual coding and getting things done. But there's another real challenge, which is, can I work with these people? Do I trust them? If I give them a job, can they get it done? Okay? And that's what we're, uh, um, you know, we're hoping to build with you guys this semester. And hopefully, we're also hoping that you're going to stick around, that you're not going to leave George Brown. This is what we're also hoping, I'm being honest and telling you that. And that you're going to stay with the same team, with the same group of people, these people that are here in the room, uh, in one form or another, from now until the time you're done uh, over the three, three years that you're here in this program, right? And so what this course is about is making those connections and making those, you know, kind of creating those bonds by giving you stuff that you have to complete before you do any kind of code whatsoever, right? That's part of it. So underlying to everything you're doing is this. And you're going to get to know people that maybe aren't so productive, right? You're going to get to know people that are late for coming into meetings, right? You're going to get to know people that are amazing at generating new ideas and that are incredible at coding. One thing we did from the very beginning was start with goal definitions. And I broke you guys into um, different specialty roles. So far, software engineers, lead software engineers, you really haven't done anything yet, right? They haven't coded one piece of code or anything like that, but I've already done that. We've done that together. We've kind of said, I'm the lead software engineer. I'm sorry. All right, that goes in direct to you. Um, I'm the lead software engineer. I'm the lead designer. I'm the producer. And you've kind of established roles for yourself, like we're playing house, right? A little bit. And, and that's okay, because that may change next semester when right? so you start to actually do the work and code. You might figure out that there's someone else who's better at coding than you. And you might step back. By the way, stepping back away from a leadership role is a leadership trait. It is, right? Here's something. You have two leaders, right? And one person has more of a vision of what they need to do than you do for this particular project, right? You could push ahead. I don't want to say multiple choice, two faults here. You could push ahead and maintain you know, control, or you could step back, right? And some of you may say, nope, I want control. That might be your red personality if you're one of those kind of people, right? Like me. Or you might be able to do something like this. No, that person is just a better person to be a leader at this time, right? And it doesn't mean that you, stepping back from a leadership role, um, you know, you're not a good leader. It actually means that you've recognized, you're able to identify that you're not the best leader for this job. So roles are important because roles allow us to divide our labor, right, the, the stuff that we're doing, um, and make everyone more productive. I'm just going to skip through these things. One thing we have to do in big teams is sometimes the what everyone is doing, their tasks, the definition of what they're going to be doing is confusing sometimes, right? So one thing that you could do in a team meeting over the next couple of uh, uh, weeks, three or four weeks from now, is start really isolating what everyone's going to be doing next semester, right? Or try and kind of go around and say, this is what I think, you know, that I should be doing, okay? Or this is what, I, and, and kind of justify why you're, why you're around, okay? So, um, now also I have to mention that we know there's a large, uh, most of your groups are going to be split up. I know that too. Okay? But let's, let's for a second believe in the simulation that you're all going to stay together for next semester. Okay? Just for a second. And if you're going to justify what you're going to do, if you could write your own role definition, what would that be if you think about you know, a software engineer? And don't just, tell, don't just regurgitate back to me what I've given you in terms of, well, this is what I think that these software engineers should do. Actually think about the things that you're going to do and the things that you won't do. If, if that's what your job is, okay, as an example. So roles are important because it allows us to they allow us to be more productive. 
Okay. And I'm not going to write these things down. Cross training is a big one. So um, here's something about cross training, right? You're working with a group and your producer gets COVID, right? And the producer gets COVID and can come in and they can only work remotely. And maybe we need somebody, and I, she's like, it's me, I'm not okay. Um, <clears throat> but um, the producer had COVID and someone else that was physically here had to take over, right? Someone else had to represent, right? As an example. And that happened in the team that was, that was over there. That happened, right? And did you have that situation as well? He just came up and he had, yeah, that's right. And it's not going to just happen one time. We need to be able to sub in sometimes. We need to wear many hats in an organization or in a team, right? Because here's something I want to share with you that I want to use again and again from now until the time we're done. The show must go on. Okay? I'm sorry, I know it's an old cliche. But the show must go on. We can't stop the show because the producer's not there, the director's not there, right? The show's gonna go on. Which means someone has to step up. Which means, instead of it being random, some random person, start thinking about substitutes. Who can be your number two, right, if you're the producer? Or, sorry, number one. Who's your number one? <laughs> right, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, you know, who is gonna be your, um, if you're a lead software engineer, who can sub in if the lead software engineer gets sick, is not available, and we still need direction? Who is that person? Cross-training is the way we do these things, and it's good to work in pairs a lot of times. So there's always someone who can take over. In the real world, how about this? You want to go on vacation with your family for a week, right? You don't want to get called when you're on vacation. Imagine if you're the only person that knows all the ins and outs of this thing. You've made yourself such a key player. Oh, that's awesome, you might say. But on the downside, you'll never get time off, right? And all of us need time off, every single one of us. So have a backup. And here's the other thing for having a backup in cross-training. Have a succession plan, right? Here's something else that really happens over time. Okay, I'm gonna ask you this question and I want you guys to answer me honestly. How many years do you think you should be in the same position? Yep. Ten. Ten, okay. 10 years, how old are you? 21, that means half your life, right? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Three, did you say three? Okay, three, anyone else have any other, any other ideas? One to two, okay, and one to two. Here's statistics, not 10, okay? 10 is, I love the fact that you're thinking 10, it's not 10. And the reason why it's not 10 is because of two things, complacency, right? Complacency means well, you kind of know what you're doing now. And it's not exciting anymore like it used to be, right? This uh, relationship you're having with your job, it used to be really exciting. You went through the honeymoon stage, and now it's not so exciting anymore. You're in there, and it, you're going on day to day, and it's rinse and repeat, 10 years, right? You know the job really, really well, but maybe too well. And maybe, you know, if, if you're staying there for 10 years, that means you really don't have anything else you want to do, just that one thing you know, all the time. It's very rare. I'm not saying that there's not good things about that. But nowadays, it's more rare than you think. And it's not great for your career. I have to tell you that too. Okay, here's something else. How long do you think it takes you before we answer how old is, what's the optimum uh, length? All right, as an example, by statistics. How long do you think it takes you to be good at your job? Yeah, a year. You agree? Does it take a year to be good at uh, any job? Good, really good. Not a person who's a, you know, a new person. Well, you're not considered new after a year, is that true? How long does it take? Three years, okay. You say three years too? Two or three years? Five months. I love you, man, but no. Yeah? I would say it depends on your prior job. Depends on your prior job. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we're brand new in the organization. And for them, for the organization, you've come off the street. Right? A year and a month, okay. Because the first month doesn't count, right? The first doesn't count. It takes about a year for you to know somewhat what your job is about. Two years for you really to understand the ins and outs. You've seen the whole cycle, the two second cycle that you've gone through. And then around three years, like people said, right? You know your job pretty solid, right? Three years in, you're pretty good, right? Um, once you get to about four years, 
it, you start just diminishing returns in terms of how much you know and how much you're going to learn in a particular role. I'm not saying for, let's say, suppose you have a skill, like you're an electrician, as an example. You're not going to get worse by your fault. You're just going to get, continue to get better and better, chances are, right? But imagine working for somebody, right, in an organization like um, a game studio, right? And you've been there doing gameplay programming for the last four years. Yeah, it can be cool, but maybe you want to be a lead. Maybe you want to change things up. Maybe you want to try AI. Maybe you want to do this. Maybe you want to do that. Maybe you want to go to another job. You want to work on another game uh, or do something else. So they say around four years. You shouldn't go more than four years without thinking about switching things up. Four years, right? Once you go beyond seven years, they say things are getting pretty stale. And at year 10, you should, you're, you've been there too long. Okay? Um, you know, that's how it normally goes for now. And you might think like four years, that's a long time. But think about this, right? You know, you start off and it's really exciting in the first month, and then you take a year to kind of learn all the ins and outs, two years to get somewhat good, three years, but by the time you're really good, we don't want to lose you in year three. We want to kind of, we've trained you for the last, you know, three years, and now we need at least another year from you before you're able to move on, okay? A lot of positions in, in large organizations say you must be there for a minimum of two years before you move on. That's in the writing when you sign up. When you sign up for an organization, you say, two years, we, we need you to, to guarantee or commit two years in our organization before you move on. And if you can't commit, we don't want you because there's too much investment in you uh, for you to move on. Less than two years, all of this. Less, moving on less than two years is also not a great thing, right? Again, remember we talked about when I look at your resume and your, your profile and I see you job hopping from one thing to the next? If you're doing a contract, okay, I mean, you have no choice, your contract is over, right? But if you're actually moving from one company to the other and you're, you've got a title and you've got like gameplay programmer at Ubisoft for a year, and then I see gameplay programmer at, you know, Southern Company for a year, gameplay programmer at Southern Company for a year, it's a year, a year, a year, a year. I'm like, hmm, right? So I, I would love to see this more. Four years as gameplay programming at Ubisoft, right? Another four years or five years uh, as a gameplay programmer at, you know, um, another studio, and so on. It's better. So team building comes down to two things: cross training and trust. So far, mm -hmm. we talked about seating arrangements, right? In the real world, a lot of times what ends up happening is there's a little bit of segregation, or what we like to call these, you know, kind of uh, pillars if you will, buckets that people get subdivided into, right? And, um, you know, we got all the artists sitting over here, and we got all the programmers sitting over here, and we got all the, uh, you know, the managers sitting on the other side of the room, and so on. And uh, you might see organizations like that. Oh, you can't go up to level three, because level three, that's all the execs, right? There's another way of doing it, which is mixing and matching, where you have your artist and your programmer and everything else sitting in one pod, if you will. They have that kind of environment. You may not be reporting to the same manager. You might have a reporting manager, um, as an example, if you're a programmer, you might be reporting to the team lead, uh, or lead the uh, software engineering manager, as an example. But you're reporting to uh, someone, a producer in that team, right? As an example, you're sitting together with them uh, during the course of creating your game. Why? We don't want to create silos, right? where it's us versus them. I'm a programmer, they're an artist, they don't understand. But we don't want that. That's not a good thing. Right? We want for us to, to break down walls and break down uh, these, uh, these obstacles and kind of work with other people. We want to be able to do that. Most organizations don't like that, the silo of, I'm a programmer, I'm an artist, we don't talk. <laughs> right? That's not good. We don't want silos. Um, at the same time, though, we don't want to disconnect our artists from the other artists. We don't want that either, right? Because, or a programmer from the other programmers, we don't want that either because we want them to have the same conventions, we want them to talk the same best practices and all that stuff, right? So that the, the senior software engineer or the software engineering manager might be managing the programmer and have regular meetings with them, but that programmer would be, be sitting right in your pocket, right? So seating arrangements is an important thing as well. How you sit, right? And, um, and imagine this in a, uh, if you have 10 people in your group, and some people do here, um, some people end up making two subgroups. Somebody will make two subgroups, 
right? Three little teams, right? Sub teams, and they get them to uh, uh, to sit separately. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. Team meetings. We talked about team meetings. Team meetings are good, and team meetings can be bad, right? Um, team meetings can take too long, and, and they eat a lot of resources, right? At the same time, team meetings can build uh, trust, and team meetings can be used to deliver information to everybody on the team. Okay, so it really depends on how you use that leader. Um, again, I, I say, you know, be cautious when you're a leader about the time you spend in the meeting, right? Because it's it's a cost. That's what it is. It's a cost, and there has to be a reason for it. Sometimes it's good enough for you to give regular communications to your team through uh, email and through other things. Oh, by the way, let's talk about you know communication for a second. Last week we talked about how to communicate and how to understand ourselves and others, right? Worst form of communication again, our review is worst form. What's the worst form of communication? You say text, yeah. In person, that's the best, right? The worst form of communication. What's the worst form of communication? Yeah. Email, letters, or something. Going through someone else, that's, that's, that's really bad, right? Um, that's the worst form of communication, right? And text is a step up because there is some back and forth, but you don't see the person, right? I don't think text is great either, to be honest. Telephone is next. Would you say telephone is next? Some people don't like the telephone anymore, yeah. Carrier pigeon, yeah? yeah. If we lived in, um, you know, House of the Dragon, those type of years, yeah, we might be able to do that, carrier pigeon stuff, yeah, that'd be cool, right? Um, in, in, in the West Coast, yeah. Right. Mail, that is the worst, for sure. Mail, like actual snail mail we're talking, not even email, that is definitely the worst kind of communication you can think of, right? I sent a letter to you at your house, right? Okay, so we don't want those kind of things. The best form of communication is in person a lot of times, right? Second best would be probably a you know kind of a conference call where you can see the person, they can see you, you can see their body language and nuances. We'll talk about communication again in, in a future conversation, right? You want to be able to see their you know their body language, you want to hear their voice, see their expressions, right? They want to see your expressions. There's an underlying you know nonverbal cues that goes on when it comes to communicating that we're going to talk about. Um, and then after that, it's telephone. And I'll tell you right now, people are averse to making calls, right? Um, you want to have a text, go on to, your, to the person you're trying to connect with to say, is it okay that I call, right? It's like a, I got to validate that it's okay that I call you. I don't want to interrupt what you're doing, you know, because I need to talk to you. By the time you send a text, I could probably pick up the phone and try to call you. And if you send me a voicemail, then I know I can't talk to you. And then I'll send you a text, right? You know, and people just don't do this enough. They don't pick up the phone. You have everyone here probably has a cell phone. I'm hoping in your pocket, right, uh, or somewhere around. You said no. You want a cell phone? You put it away. And um, if you don't have a cell phone, that's crazy nowadays. So everyone has the ability for us to communicate with, and but yet we don't use that part. We use texting. We use Discord. We use everything else. And even when we're on Discord. Uh, many times when we're on Discord, we're, we're, we're blacked out and we're texting in a meeting, right? As opposed to physically, you know, going on the mic. Like we're afraid to be on the mic. Guys, come on. Right? It's the worst form of communication. Terrible, right? So team meetings are a way to improve your communication, potentially, and share information and get people's voices heard. That's what they're for, they're for more than anything else. They're not necessarily to deliver a message you know, as an example, that is very sensitive, unless you need to do it personally. If you're going to send a message that's going to affect most of the organization and you do it through an email, that is going to be a follow-up to the meeting you had, right? Where you introduce that, in, you know, that information, that you know, breaking change that you're doing for the organization, that uh, um, life-changing thing that's going on with your workers, you've already talked about that with them in person. You've delivered that, that message face-to-face, -face, and now you're following up with an email. Okay, right? But if how you deliver the information is through email alone, that has that done. And that's why meetings can be good for that. All right, so team meetings. Um, so these are some, some, some thoughts about how to make a meeting better, all right? Have a written agenda. 
Uh, review the attendee list. Okay, note people who are not present, whether virtually or physically. Manage by the clock. So when you have an agenda item, you stick to the clock. Like we said, time boxing with Agile. If we go beyond the five minutes you've allocated, you stop and move on. All right? If you don't manage by the clock, you may not get to all your agenda items. And if you don't get to your agenda items, the next meeting, people aren't going to believe that the agenda items are going to be talked about, and it's going to reduce the confidence that they have in you. Okay? So manage by the clock. Use a parking lot, which is kind of interesting, which is like, let's put that on the parking lot. Let's circle back to that another time. I'll get back to that you know, later on. But actually get back to it. Okay, just don't park it and then never talk about it again. That can happen too in a meeting, right? And the other one is um, pre-wire important decisions, okay? Which means have one-to-one -one discussions. This is like cheating before the meeting, right? I'm gonna, let's say for example, I know that I want Brady and I really want Harsh as an example on my side when it comes to this important thing. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna talk to Harsh, I'm gonna talk to Brady ahead of time, right? Before I go into the meeting. Pre-wired the stuff that I'm going to that, that I'm going to be doing. It's actually cheating in some ways, and some people may not like it. But I'm trying to get buy-in before I get buy-in, right? It's a bit of a trick, but at the same time, it saves time in a meeting. I'm gathering allies to my decision. I'm also getting feedback before I come up with this challenging decision. Like for example, let's say I say to James, I say, "This is what I'm thinking about doing." James, is like, terrible idea, right? For me not to listen to James because he's like a valued team member is stupid, right? I want to get his, his information. I want to talk to him on, on, on Foria, right? I want to talk to him and say, hey, tell me about um, what do you think about this idea? And if he says it's terrible, or if Angela says it's no good, or somebody, Peter, says to me, you know what, I don't agree with you, right? Maybe it's not something I want to bring up in a meeting. Maybe this is the wrong decision. Maybe I need to think about it more. I need some more time to bake in the oven this idea before I bring it up to the, to the, you know, the general team, right? Socialize it with your team first ahead. Pre-wire your important decisions before you get into the meeting itself. By the way, guys, a lot of this, producers, you can use right now. You have uh, something you want to change, right? Talk about it with your team member. Assign a scribe, right? Um, someone who take notes. Sometimes you can do this, you can pull this off now with automatic meeting recordings. You can do that, right? When you record the meeting. But in order for you to record the meeting, the meeting has to be able to be heard, right? So if you're using a recording device, um, you know, that's good. But sometimes we also want to take notes, the, kind of the important highlights, so they don't have to watch the entire damn meeting again, right? We don't want that. We want almost like this transcript, so we can kind of look at the highlights of things that have been discussed. Right? A sign of spread. And this is, I would say, probably just as important as the meeting topics themselves. Follow up, follow up, follow up. If you don't follow up on the things that you parked in the parking lot, if you don't follow up on the important decisions that you made with the team, your meeting is useless. You just spent the company's money and right, you could be in trouble if nothing comes out of that meeting. A good example of that is a manager who always has a lot of meetings, but nothing ever gets done. And I'm one of those people who have seen that in my life. I've seen it, been with that. I'm sure other people here who are a little older as well. I've seen that, even maybe some of you have seen that kind of stuff, where you've been in a meeting and nothing gets done. There's no result from that meeting. It's just literally useless, right? So we don't want that. We want meetings to count for something because they're very expensive. They are super expensive, right, to have. So make sure they count. All right, team building. Um, internal websites aren't as popular anymore, but if they were, we do use things like SharePoint and those kind of things still. They do exist in a lot of organizations. Uh, OneDrive folders, Google Drives, all those kind of things where we have important information. Um, and they replace some of the stuff that's been, um, you know, kind of stated here. They might have important things about, um, like, folders on the, or in the in the organization's drive. Sometimes we call it a, uh, an H drive might have a letter assigned to it or something. Are you part of the H drive, the K drive? Because we're always in the K drive, we're sharing our stuff on the K drive or the H drive. They say weird stuff like that. Or are you on SharePoint? Or you know, did you join our OneDrive? Or Teams uh, group or whatever it's gonna be? Or are you on the Discord server? There you go, there's the same kind of stuff. Discord server and SharePoint and all those things have replaced internal uh, websites is what we used to have before. 
where we can communicate and share information and resources. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this. And I, I want to try and get this all out. We'll take a break, and then afterwards, I have an activity for you guys to do, of course, because this is the build-up, right? And I'll theater, you're, you're talking to me about it. You're smiling, you're like, I'm tired already, man. You're killing me with this stuff, right? And it's probably true. Right? But um, let's talk about uh, team buying and motivation. So warning signs, I love this one. Absences, tardiness, being late, lack of commitment and effort, complaints, lack of effort, apathy, unfulfilled requests. You've asked them to do something and you know they don't do it, right? Or they say they're gonna do it, yeah, 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 but they never do it, ever, 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 ever. Right? That kind of thing, right? So that's a warning sign. Um, how do we address the warning signs? Because we're going to see these warning signs for some people when it comes to motivation. We want to address the warning signs sooner rather than later. We want to go directly to the source. Don't talk to, you know, Nora to get a to get a beat on what ha what's happening with Peter, right? I don't want to do that. I want to talk directly with Peter in this case if, if I'm having a problem with that. Okay, it's it's just more effective. Okay, because again, it goes back to the whole gossip thing. So I want to really talk to five people and then everyone knows your business except for the person that I really need to talk to? No, go to that person directly, right? Um, keep communication open and sometimes, here's the thing that I talked about before as a leader, right? You need to make unpopular decisions, which means moving people around or, in the worst case, letting them go. Okay, this can happen and it's part of you being a leader, you have to make that decision. Sometimes it's a snap decision. You say, you know what, HR, I need someone on this thing. This person's got to go, right? And people may not understand why you made that decision, but maybe there's enough red flags that you've seen as a leader over the time that you're a leader that you're like, this person's got to go. They're, you know, they're toxic to the team or whatever, right? So think about the warning signs and the stuff that you're going to be uh, uh, addressing and how you're going to address them. This is tough, okay? Show appreciation, okay? And although it seems easy, and I've written it down here in a few little bullet points, it's huge, it's tough, right? Remember I talked about the four colors last week? We're green, kind of if you understand, you know, what maybe people want. You want, uh, you know, the people who are green can understand how, um, I don't know, you can help other people and, and all that kind of stuff, right? If you're a red person, I'm a red person, right? And like I told you before, I want to be able to appreciate um, the other people. There's two things. Either I need to get to know you really, really well, which means I need to spend time with you, right? Or I'm going to have someone else deliver that recognition and that appreciation for me, right? Like example, your direct manager, okay? Your direct manager or team lead probably knows what you want more than I do as a leader, okay? So I want to go to them and say, listen, I want to celebrate you know, this person's successes and I want to reward them, what do they want? Because not everyone wants a public reward. Not everyone wants that. For example, some green people or blue people may not want that. It's too loud for them, right? They might probably want to be re rewarded quietly, right? Um, and there might be some red person or a yellow person that wants to have a whole party because of what they did, right? It's the same. So it really depends on the personality. You need to understand how to do that. So it's a lot more difficult than this than a few things uh, that we're showing here. So show appreciation is important. Sharing your vision. The team works better if they understand the big picture. Um, so don't keep your vision to yourself. Make sure that you consistently update your vision and the stuff that you've talked about them at, let's say for that, that big meeting that you had. They, you kind of communicated the vision of, of and the direction of, of the company as an example, right? You want to be able to do that. Um, do a team survey. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes you'll be surprised when you get back, right? The, you know, the feedback you get back from the survey. You might be surprised, and it might not be in a good way. <laughs> you might think you're doing great, and then you get a survey back that says, he's a bore, right? I really don't like Tom too much, right? Or um, you know, you might get a, a survey back that says it's going too slow, or you know, the stuff that they said that we're supposed to do, the company said that we're, we're supposed to accomplish, we haven't accomplished it. I'm really disappointed. They've lied to us. You know, whatever. They're going to say a lot of stuff. You get a lot of feedback from a survey, um, as long as people know that it's anonymous. When people think it's not anonymous, then you're not going to get good feedback, right? And that's why I recommend using a third party, 
So it's completely anonymous. Um, when you're going to do a team survey, encourage participation, but don't overly go over the top of it. And I mean, like, there's been professors that I, that I was, you know, in university and even now, um, they're like, hey, listen, if you take five minutes to fill up the student survey, uh, you know, you all get 2%. Yeah, I've seen that, right? And that's not right, right? It's like, I'm actually paying you to do my survey, right? So I get feedback. Feedback should come from you. I shouldn't have to pay you to do my survey, right? So be reasonable with that kind of stuff. Encourage participation, but you know, don't pay for it. I, I don't agree with that. And don't make it mandatory. If people don't want to talk to you, they're not going to talk to you. That's also a statement if they don't answer your survey. And um, quality of life is a big one. This goes back to the whole balance issue, right? Where we want to have time off, right? We want to be able to have time off with, you know, and, and also have things like, you know, at the end of the of, of the, uh, the game, we're going to have a big celebration, you know, that kind of stuff. At the end of the week, we're going to have uh, Friday afternoons off or something like that. Uh, after 2 p.m. the whole work, everyone goes home and has a great weekend, long weekend, or something like that, if we're in person. Or guess what we're going to do? We're going to get together uh, at the end of every month, and we're going to play something together as a team, right? And you're all encouraged to come up, and we're going to pay for it from a company perspective. You know, days like, uh, things like Wonderland days, people do that. Uh, Ubisoft did that this year, where they pay for the entire company and friends and family to go to Wonderland, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and all those kind of things. Quality of life isn't, it is something where you give people a chance to recharge, give them a chance to take vacation and, um, and time off, and uh, create a balance between uh, the amount of hours you're asking to work and overtime and then time off. It's really important. One thing is uh, the right to disconnect is becoming a real issue. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about this, the right to disconnect. It's uh, something that we should encourage with our employers as well and our employees, where when you're done, when you go home, you know, it's your time, right? It's not my time. And if I'm calling you and you're not responding, it's because it's after hours. I shouldn't expect you to ever respond when it's after hours, right? Because you need to disconnect. I've already taken enough of your life away, right, in my company, and I want to give you some of the life back. You're not living to work for me, right? You're living to make, you're, you're kind of working to, to make some money to live and enjoy yourself, right? Hopefully along the way, right? So we need to give you a chance for people to disconnect, and that's kind of the right to disconnect. I really truly sure believe it. Okay, I think we're kind of at the end here. Yeah, and I'm not going to go on more than this. What I want to do now, and thank you for listening, I'm going to stop recording this, but I want to kind of do one more piece of administration before for the, for the recording. Again, just keep in mind where we are. We're talking about teams today, and next week we're going to do a topic presentation. I want to take a short break, so we're sitting at 3.54, right? I want to take a short break, and for the remainder of the day, what I want you guys to work on is what is leadership? What is teamwork? Put together that, start putting together that PowerPoint today, right, before next week, because there's not a lot of time, believe it or not. And I want to give you a chance to do that here in class, right, and answer your questions, and even if you want to show me some of the stuff here we have, um, to help you out. Okay, so we're going to just take a break. Let's take uh, five minutes if you want to do a washroom break, and we'll come back and continue.